I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive through the crisis that now everybody is aware that we are already walking through. And today we have a boots on the ground with Christina West, and I'm very happy to have her with us because she's going to help us understand the transition into this next currency, which we're all headed to. Now, she spent several years living in not just the U.S., but in England and in Europe and prior to and during the transition into the Euro system. So therefore, she has direct and personal experience with how governments hide that transition. Pro my bet is it's pretty similar to what I experienced in 1971. She's been in technology for many, many years, and so we are going to talk about that in a few minutes. But she also got to dabble in luxury real estate, both sales and rental in Spain. So this is a real boots on the ground experience, particularly in an area that a lot of our viewers are very interested in. But there's also a very important perspective since we're facing the transition to a new financial system. So perhaps there's some lessons that we can learn from all of this discussion. Christina, thank you so much for being here today and being part of the community. Thank you, Lynette. I'm excited to be here and talk about this. It's very timely. Uh, isn't it though? Because there's always in everything, there's always winners and then there's always losers. So in a recent study that was done, they looked at the prosperity since the introduction of the Euro in 99. And guess who the big winner was? Germany. Mm, surprise. <laughs> yeah, not a surprise. They couldn't take over Europe via a war, but they could do it fiscally because they spent, or they rather, they were the manufacturers to Europe and because Europe could now borrow more cheaply, the other countries, Greece, Italy, all of those, well, then they could buy those, those goods and have, you know, take on a lot of debt. So... I want to kind of start there because we, it came out in 99 and so far 19 countries currently use the common currency. The balance of the Eurozone members are supposed to tie into that by 2022. But do you remember how the government and the central bankers sold the public on this transition and the benefits? Do you remember that? Yeah, so the, it, it's a really interesting and very long process, the euro. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of back and forth between the countries because obviously there had to be winners and losers. You know, you had the, the what they called more the Northern Europeans versus the Southern Europeans. It's always been that France, Germany, and England pretty much ran the show. So you had Holland and, you know, uh, Belgium and, and Luxembourg in there because they're in the bank and Switzerland because they're in the banking mix, but certain countries never went into the Euro. They weren't Eurozone. So you, the, the big holdout of course was Switzerland because Switzerland has its own currency, its own sovereignty. It considers itself neutral. It didn't want to be part of the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. From a currency standpoint, Britain was the big hold holdout. The UK right. did not, or Britain in particular, because obviously um, it, um, Ireland and Scotland are part of, of Great Europe, Britain, right? or Great Britain yeah. rather. But but part of part of uh, Ireland is not part of Great Britain. You have two two Ireland, so that was a big change mm -hmm. as well. But the way that it was sold was basically that it was going to be easier to trade. You know, if you and that extended to the common man. So the common man used to take a caravan or his family over in the car to go to Europe for a holiday for two weeks and stay, you know, even at a not, you know, not luxury place, but just, you know, go over to France and 
bike and stay by the sea and maybe pitch a tent and stay at a campground, that guy wasn't going to have to, from England was not going to have, or from other parts of Europe was not going to have to change his money into another currency. So you could pass borders, you could pass money, you'd have one single currency. Shangri-La was going to be so much easier to do everything. There was a huge public relations campaign. Mm -hmm. The actual transition to the euro took about three years from the start when they started printing the money and putting it into circulation until it was actually, you know, finalized. But in that in that period, there was resistance because there is a shadow banking economy in or, you know, shadow economic economy. economy in in Europe. It's not all it, the money is not all in circulation. It's the savings is not necessarily done in the bank. Mm-hmm. Let's just put it that way. And then and then money for for employment is not necessarily passed in any denomination other than a cash some kind of cash. So you have black money in Europe that is very accepted even in real estate. It, it money physical cash passes to avoid taxes and and that sort of thing. And it's kind of known, but nobody talks about it. Well, that's interesting because they've been doing a lot over the years, especially since the crisis, to crack down on that and transition us into, all of us really, into digital. But Europeans were not very keen on debt. Right. No, I mean, no, most people not all would buy their their homes outright. So how did that impact it? And what happened with inflation, say, leading up to that time? Because you were in Spain, too. And, and I it, and I also spent time in Italy. And if you recall, the lira was one of those lop off the zeros yes. kind of kind of currencies. It was getting unwieldy. I, I mean, you you had things that cost a million something euros and it was only like a thousand dollars or a thousand, you know, what would, uh, not euros, a thousand lira, no, a million lira would cost like a thousand euro. So that's kind of how it, how it went. But um, yeah, that was very difficult. And then the other thing is about real estate. Not everybody owns a home in Europe. Some, some economies in Europe, people own their home and many rent. So you have this you have this kind of landed gentry sort of uh, phenomenon that uh, the the wealthy held their land, you know, as 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 ownership mm-hmm. and then everybody else rented. There are a lot of a, a lot of families, for example, live in apartments. There's a real middle class. Europe is obviously m- more socialist than the United States. So not everybody was buying their place. And it was even when i lived there i rented because it was more more cost effective to rent i could live in a million dollar home and pay you know a thousand euros a month so oh wow yeah it was that's kind of the way it worked especially in those economies where there had been inflation you know it was the same with the peseta the peseta was was quite high it was another one of those lop off the zeros kind of currencies um there was inflation in terms of the money but the cost of living was not too bad so you you prices you still had buying power with those currencies now was that from your perspective as like were you working for an american company in there i was okay. working for an american i was in tech i was working for a big american software company and i had um i i made them pay me in the local currency because but it I was want based on an American salary. Uh, I went over, I went over on work papers when I started, and I picked up my European passport in that period. So I was waiting for the eurozone to be established so I could get my EU citizenship. I have a mother who's Irish, and if you have an Irish mother, that's a whole nother story. But if you have an Irish, if you have an Irish parent, you can. Um, you can be a naturalized citizen in Ireland. It's a treaty that was passed, or naturalization law that was passed in the 50s between the US and Ireland. It's one of the few where you can have two passports. So- What about the father? uh, No, it it could be the the father and it can also be the grandparent. Oh, all right. I I only ask because my my ex-husband is Irish. Oh my gosh, that you could totally- 
We'll talk later. You must. It's such a good thing to do. Yes. I, I, I think you should do it. Okay. Well, he wasn't my mother or my father, but my children's father. So, and we'll then I think once your children are Irish, you can also get your Irish citizenship. You can apply as a family, I believe. Hmm. Well, we might want to think about that because that would be really a handy thing. It's a do. great plan B. I mean, you know, especially when it comes to things like healthcare and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, part of what I want to go back to though was, um, do you know how your salary compared to the average person's salary then, and therefore, you know, it didn't seem, the cost of living didn't seem too bad to you, but what about the average citizen? Well, uh, as I said, I, I made my company hire me as a, in, with a European salary. Um, I knew the currency was, well, actually, that's not true. When I went over at first, I have to go back because I went over at first in 1990 and it wasn't Eurozone yet. So no. I, I, I had them pay me in the local currency because I didn't want to be affected by the change because the change was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew we were going into the Eurozone eventually, but it wasn't for 10 years later. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, the benefit of exchange, it would be better to make money in pounds at that time. And then when I went back again in, uh, cause I had a lag of a couple of years in between, then I went back and everything was also still in local currency, so. Yes, but, but was your salary comparable to the average worker there, do you think? Or yes. was it, no, it was yeah, comparable? Well, it, it, it was because I worked for an American company and they already had a, they already knew pretty much what I was making. So I, I kind of made them do a one-to-one -one for what I would be making in the States. I, I probably was paid a little bit better than, than most people. Yeah. That, well, and that, that was really what I wanted to understand because a lot of times when, when I've traveled to Europe, I used to ask a lot of questions and I would always take a guide in case I couldn't speak the language, I could still understand that. And, and most people I found really had no clue about inflation, et cetera. So in the 90s, I was in England in the 70s because I did a semester abroad there. And that was during Nixon's era and, you know, the scandal, Watergate. And so it was, it was pretty interesting. But your salary then was higher than the average salary from somebody that's not working, not an American working for an American company. So how did you notice, did you notice prices going up to scale into the, the Euro? Yeah. So, so my, the first job, not so much because we, everybody was still on their own currency. So I, I got paid in pounds and I did that. So I would have the benefit of the exchange. Mm -hmm. the, the pound dollar bounced around quite a bit in that period. And I, I literally had a second job changing money. I, I was, I was moving money from, from pounds to dollars, you know, fast and furious. Cause I still had a home and in the States. So I was paying my mortgage with the extra money I was making by exchanging the currency <laughs> and switching it back to dollars. So, so that, that kind of worked for a while. Then when I went back, uh, right around the time that we went into the Eurozone, mm -hmm. um, it was almost parity. So the dollar to the Euro, um, in terms of what what really happened for the common people was they they did not have the benefit of exchange like i did right that that, exactly. that was that was one one thing that was very different my salary was quite high um i'll tell you a funny story uh in 1990 when i went to the bank in england to set up my bank account because you have to go and meet the bank manager back in 1990 um and I went with the gentleman that I worked with. He had the same job that I did. I was quite young. I was like 30. And um, we walked into the office and, you know, they, the, the nomenclature is a little different. The, the way they, they, they call a bank a checking account, uh, you know, a current account and that sort of thing. So I kind of brought him to translate for me, even though it was English. And when I told the bank, ma the bank manager asked me how much I made. And when I told him, he said, he said, no, 
I think he said not a year, a, a, a month. And I said, that is my salary for, for the month. And he looked at the guy because I was a woman. He looked at the guy then in England, I was the only woman who had that job. And I'm he sure. looked at the guy and he looked at me and, and he said, the guy sitting next to me said, yeah, that's, that's, that's her salary. It was very unusual. It, it, it was an unusual salary. Um, but for the common person, um, in in your in England, I think home ownership changed. But in in Spain, when I was there, luxury goods and home ownership changed tremendously because of the. I think be, mostly because of this shadow economy, where people needed to get their money. They weren't. They were a little concerned, honestly, to bring their money, all this money they had in the house, let's say in the mattress, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to the bank. And not have any questions asked. That's not the way Europe works. You know, you bring in a large amount of money, they're like, where did this come from? So a lot of people were afraid to bring their cash to the bank. So what they did was they went out and bought houses. Yeah. Okay. And they bought luxury goods. And and I can tell you from around ninety-nine to two thousand one or two thousand two, it was like somebody opened up a Mercedes. Uh, car dealership and let everybody take one. All of a sudden, everybody had a car, like a luxury, like a really nice luxury car. And and months, you know, like a year before that, no one was driving a nice car. I mean, and the roads, and th this happened in England too. The roads got packed. The people, there were all of a sudden a lot more cars on the road because people were going after large ticket items to basically get their money into circulation and out of their house. Right, because in the Euro, bills and notes and coins were introduced in Spain in um, January 2002, even though they joined the Euro, the Eurozone in 99. And then by March, that the currency was demonetized. So you couldn't use it for anything. Right. Yeah. There was there were there was a there was a bumpy transition to the euro. How can um, you talk about that a little bit more? From what I recall, you could get euros at the bank, but then there was a period where you couldn't spend them. You know, you could hmm. start to change money, but then you couldn't really you couldn't use it for everything. And then in this, and then the retail economy was later. Like I think they let you use it for maybe some credit or some debt, but they didn't let you didn't go into circulation. And then eventually, you, there was a day, like a moment, like the I think it was like the first of January two thousand two or something like that, that everybody had to be able to take the euro. But there was a moment yes. where you had you had lira or pesetas, and you had euro in your pocket, and you had to ask. Uh, any any store, are you taking this? What are you taking? You know, and fast and furious trying to get rid of coins because nobody wanted to deal with the coins. So it was all paper money. You're trying to be in as much paper. You know, if you had a jar of coins sitting around, you you got rid of it. And there was a there was also a cutoff where you couldn't take your old currency to the bank anymore and get any any credit for it. Or was get that was probably March of two thousand and two. That was probably it, yeah. So now for me, um, I went to Hungary. Um, when did we go to Hungary? I think it was like 2009. I think it was 2009. And Hungary was on a dual currency system. So you could use forints, which is, you know, I ordered in forints. I also ordered in euros because we went other places as well. And I just wasn't really thinking about it. And I remember I got $2,500 worth of forints and it was like the stack was big enough to choke a horse. Yeah. And I got $3,000 worth of euros and it was like a teeny weeny stack. And my first response was, wow, they must be experiencing a lot of inflation in Hungary. But because I ordered everything at the same time, and I had a little book where I notated how much each bill cost me in terms of dollars. Then when I would go out, I had in the bills, there were two choices, just like you were talking about. I could pay for it in forints or I could pay for it in euros. 
And because I had that done my, my work, it was very easy for me to compare how much it actually cost me, right? Because it's that nominal confusion, how much it actually cost me if I used one currency or I use the other currency. And That's very right. interesting, it was a 20% premium for me to use euros rather than foreigns, which if I hadn't done that, I don't know that I would have actually known that. Interesting. Well, this this brings up the question of, of currency so and sovereignty, right? So um, how, there, as you said, there's like 19 countries, I believe, that are in the currency at the moment in Eurozone, but they, that doesn't include all the Europe, all the EU countries. So there are no. a number of countries that have maintained their sovereignty. So you have, I think, I believe Hungary is one of them, Sweden, Denmark, obviously England. Uh, there's a few others that they're just not coming to mind, but um, you have quite, you have some countries who, who maintain their sovereignty. And at first I can tell you, because I didn't know as much about this switch that, as I know now, having lived through it, but at, at first I thought to myself, well, that's such a mistake for England not to join the Euro. I mean, what are they thinking? Like, you know, nobody's going to like want to carry pounds and euros and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, at the end of the day, the, you know, we know about money printing, right? We know about quantitative easing, and that is basically the advantage to maintaining the sovereign currency. So... Yes. Yeah. Look so, at Greece. yeah. So this is where some of that initial uh, inflation came from, was these countries were able to print themselves out of debt or print themselves into being able to pay their debt or however, however they were using the money. And that's where some of that inflation and devaluation of the currency came from. Italy is an example, I think, in like Very 1992, good, yeah. right around then. When I was there, they, they had some issues. They printed money. That's why the currency kept they kept adding the zeros. Um, so that happened. But then in, in the case of England in 2008, you know, 2006, 7, 8, well, our, our, our economic recession was after Europe's, I believe. So they, they, they went into their, their crisis, you know, their recession a little bit at a slightly different time than ours. Yes. And but they, I think actually ours led because, are you talking about the sovereign debt crisis? Because that yeah. was like 2012, yeah. 13, 14. So that actually wasn't all that long ago. And and again, they never got out of it. But, you know, part of what I'm wondering is, is during the transition, so from the 90s until 2002, right, uh, some of the reports that I had read previously had stated, and it depended on the country, but they they devalued the currency leading into the conversion to the euro and they justified it and then the way they did the transition like could you tell if you were going shopping at the grocery store and you had the one currency and you had both currencies like i saw the difference in foreigns because i was paying attention um, were you able to see that and understand that it cost you more in euros than it did in the low in pesetas or the local currency? Yeah, because I was because at that time I was still uh, most of, uh, I still had money in in the states, so you know there were, I was still feeding myself for a period of time with dollars, changing dollars back, changing over, um, and. Yes, I was very conscious of it because I obviously was looking for the deal, you know. So at, at the time, you know, the, when we switched to when we switched to the euro in Europe and I had dollars, I was getting a 20 percent. I was getting 20 percent back. You know, it was, uh, it was an advantage because it was 0.8 to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Then it went up as high as 1.4 to the dollar and flipped. So when I went back to Italy, uh, one of the first things I did was I, I had a, I had friends who were in the real estate business and I was like, let's sell villas. I can get a bunch of Americans to come over here that it's the, the euro is cheap. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's uh, let's sell the vi villas and vineyards was kind of our, our specialty. And we we did that. And, and halfway through that, it switched the dollar, the, the parity. We got to parity and then it switched over. So the dollar became weaker. Um, so th that was a difference, but there were, there were advantages, like, for example, in that, 
introduction of the euro, countries like Germany, uh, as strong as they were, they thought that they got a raw deal because the way that the uh, the Deutsche Mark was valued was they thought not to their advantage, but at the end of the day, it ended up being to their advantage because it was it, it was a bargain to do exports. So, right, right. so they had they had a change there. That it's really it's so interesting. What do you think it's going to look like? I mean, are you seeing some of the signs that? that you might have seen when you were living there. Are you seeing that over here at this point? And, and then we got to talk about technology because the COVID virus has really, you know, it's taken a lot of the regulatory pressure off of big tech. And I mean, they couldn't have wished for us all, you know, especially me, I mean, you know, I'm a locavore, so I'd rather spend a little bit more and support a local guy than give all my money to Amazon. But frankly, since I'm not leaving my house now, <laughs> I am, you know, and I hate to say it, I really do, um, but I'm using Amazon more because even when I've tried my local stores, well, they're, they're either shut or, you know, I mean, I just can't really they may not do open it. again. They may not open again. You may not have a choice as a local war except to shop at big box stores because that might be the only ones that survive. I mean, it, it's it's tough. I, we'll we'll talk about it. I'll answer your first question. So, um, I think you said, did I find a a difference in? Um, just remind me again. <laughs> now remember? I have to remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, well, it's the boost in the use and the advantage that the COVID-19 really creates a cover for growth of big tech. Yes. Right. And also, you know, it's a great excuse. I mean, if this were another financial crisis and we were just bailing out the big financial institutions, I mean, we are doing that and we are bailing out the corporations. I mean, oh, no okay. doubt about that. But now okay. we're going to bail everybody out. So, you know, do you see different signs? I mean, it's a little different because that was not a crisis like we're going through right now in the COVID-19. But yeah. there are similarities that happen during every single regime shift and financial regime shift. So are you seeing some parallels? Yeah, I, that, I think that was your question. So yeah, I do see, I see a couple of things. One, I see people starting to realize that their money's probably in the wrong place number one they've got it they've got to so <laughs> they've got <laughs> they've got to figure i i know i've gone through that exercise like you're you thinking oh but my bank is insured but uh you know the dollar is strong but you know whatever it is i do think that they're all this money printing they're not going to have any choice but to reset the currency in some way the question is if they want to go through the public relations that Europe went through. I mean, they had to convince a bunch of sovereign countries that don't necessarily like each other and have a history of war to all get into all get into the same house and play nice. And it was it was a bumpy road. It took it took quite a long time to to get that all established. Plus, you know, there's a there there's a psychological um relationship that people have with their currency they know what it looks like it means something to them all of that was going away and they're going into this new system i think we'll go into a new system whether they'll call it the dollar or they'll call it the whatever the granny the papa i don't know <laughs> well, but uh, the, they will probably call it the dollar my guess is they'll continue to call it the dollar so that people don't fight and have backlash like that. I mean, that's what they did in 71, you know, it was still the dollar in, in July of 71 and in September of 71. And that's what they did back in 1913 too. So they like to keep it as close to what people are used to as possible so that we don't realize that anything has changed when in reality, everything has changed. And that takes us back to the technology piece again. Yeah. 
So, so I, so I work in tech. I, I've always worked with large enterprise accounts. Um, I do that now. In fact, I work with a very large conglomerate, one of the biggest in the in the world. It's global. It has a lot of companies underneath it, and you know, I'm I'm constantly getting a, a you know touch touching base with the clients just to see how they're doing. Everybody, I, I talked to somebody this morning. Um, I have my notes here. He said basically it's they're essential, but it, it's homework now. So everybody's in this new phase where we've we've had we've gone through crisis mode we've gotten people sorted at home to work i will tell you a lot of people are not going back to the office right they, the companies have spent the money to get people out um the office the social distancing is just not going to work uh for for a lot of people to go back you know they'll either stagger it or they'll have 50 percent and then they have to have uh, I'm in a business where we uh, we sell equipment for for printing and stuff like that. So people are printing signage and they're trying to get, you know, how they're trying to get customers in. Retails hurt. Um, so we're we've gone now. We've gone now from this like, you know, s disruption is at a speed in technology that's unparalleled. Number oh, yeah. one. And now we're going into this accelerated um, innovation phase where people are not, we reacted now, now people are almost starting to think about being proactive. They're not, they're not quite there yet. They're more in this stabilization phase. So they're refocusing their efforts. They're planning for the future, but they don't know what the future is going to look like. Right. And um, you're referring to businesses planning for the future. Businesses, but, yeah. Business. Right. Well, you know, we're all doing it right. But we don't know what it's going to look like. But businesses don't have a choice because they have to think so far ahead. So I see, um, you know, plus, you know, dump on top of that, that we are we are firmly in a recession. It, it, or worse. <laughs> or worse. Right. <laughs> I, I would say it's a depression. Right. But, so, you know, imagine, either way. Imagine now. Uh, the the lower economic uh, part of the socioeconomic system has been affected greatly. All yes. the stores are closed. All the consumer spending is affected. People are out of work. Thirty million of them. Uh, companies, the white collar type companies, my my the kind, kinds of enterprise companies I work with, they haven't started layoffs yet. Wait till the second quarter is over. In the second quarter, we're going to see a completely different thing because we're going to have a much better understanding of how this is going to play out, probably. Mm -hmm. And the numbers will be in because obviously this quarter's earnings were not affected as much as next quarter's mm -hmm. earnings are going to be off the chart horrible. So um, people are going into, so say they're in this stabilization phase now, but they're now going to go into this rapid transformation stage. And I expect we're going to see a lot of merger and active merger and acquisition activity as well as divestiture. So merger and acquisition to find a way to grow because they have to maintain their growth mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. and divestiture because we're in a recession and they, they got, they've got to save some money here and there. So, um, that's what I'm prepared for. That's that's kind of where where I'm focusing my effort. I'm in a kind of strategic role, so I that's the way I I try to work with my my clients. But everybody's just doesn't know what's going to happen. It, no, I mean it, it, it's a great cover for a transition because, as you said, they don't need to roll out any big campaign. People first, they're scared. And you have to be scared enough to be willing to accept what is coming, which of course is a lot of what my work is about is to help us see what's coming. So they say, so you can say no, so we can retain some choices. And now, I mean, everybody's just getting really tired of being in their homes That's and right. they want a normal life back. So we're seeing pushback, but you know, are those 30 million people, we just got the ADP report today, and it was really quite horrendous. And it showed that most of that loss, you're working with larger companies, but most of those job losses happened in small businesses. And the PPP, Payroll Protection Plan, well, you know, th that hasn't rolled out as smoothly and helped as many little guys stay in business, but that's still debt. 
So yeah. they're still, and even though 75% of that debt will be forgiven if they used it for payroll, what happens after September 30th? Right. So, and how might that impact the larger companies too? Because these companies, if they manage to survive this, the small ones, and that's almost 50% of the labor force. So if they manage to survive this, are they going to be able to generate an income to survive it further? And what do you think about the debt loads? I mean, I don't know if you're if you're privy to the debt loads of the companies that that you service, but well, well, they. I mean, for example, I have I have a, a couple of large utility companies, and and usually oh. they are beneficiaries of low interest rates. Right. And usually they would have some benefit maybe to oil being cheaper, but it's, it's trumped by prior part in the pen. <laughs> it's trumped, it's trumped by, by everything else that's going on. So, um, you know, same thing with they, the airlines, right? Exactly. Uh, exactly. So there are going to be some, very interesting changes. I'm just trying to be ahead of it enough with my clients that they're thinking strategically. They also think, you know, that I might be able to help them at, at that moment. But uh, one thing that that I don't see returning is any kind of trickle down economics. Um, obviously, because the people they want to spend money are now unemployed and they're returning they're returning their cars they just bought in the last year to the to the car dealership if if they don't default on their car loan so um you know one thing i i will tell you i talked to a friend in sweden recently and they are almost completely cashless I now know. and that is i think that is the future of what we have coming i i think this you know this reset and this new currency is going to have a, 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 I think, a large cashless component. Absolutely, uh, and that's because, that's part of what's happening right now as well. Because it was very normal for me to use cash when I would go to these local places. Right. But you know, if I'm ordering from Amazon, I'm not using cash. Right. When was the last? When was the last time you went to the ATM? Uh, was it the months beginning ago. of this crisis? I went yesterday. Yeah. Months oh, ago. Okay, Megan went. Megan went yesterday. There was yeah. a line so long, and can, the drive-through was like twenty-five cars. So I wow. went to walk up, and I was sixth in line at the walk up. Wow. Yeah. All right. So they limit people are still. Do they limit how much you could take out? Yeah, they limited um, to four hundred, and I was trying to take out more than that, but it wouldn't let me. Wow. And, and actually, in this pandemic, what's been really interesting was the initial, I didn't realize that was still going on, frankly, because I haven't left my house. So <laughs> I haven't gone to the ATM. But, you know, there was this huge rush for cash. And there have been more restrictions, though that's been true since 2008. More restrictions have been put on. And then uh, Neil Cash Carey and the Federal Reserve, uh, he is part of the Federal Reserve, but came out and said, it's not, not a problem. We'll just print as much money as we need because there was a run on the banks that, were, that was happening. And right. there was a run on the stock market that was happening and on the bond market. So, yeah, so, so the bond, the bond market is interesting. I'd love to get your take because I, I spoke to some, I've been speaking to friends kind of as this has been unfolding and, you know, we're all trying to figure out where to put our money. And obviously, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, buying gold is good. I've done that. I've taken my money out of my, I've really taken my money out of my, any equities or, you know, I did all that a while ago. Good job. But but a but a friend of mine I spoke to recently, um, a lot of four hundred one ks don't have an any kind of allocation other than equities and bonds, um, yep. not even an ETF kind of ones, not even not so so his so he was looking at an aggregate e bond ETF, and I was like I think the run on the bond thing is it's already the bond thing is already run up, so now you're going to go into bonds. At maybe not a great time. Plus, the FDIC, whole, the whole FDIC thing of protecting your money 
doesn't apply to equities and bonds. So. Right. But even the FDIC is frankly insolvent. If we were to have a bank run, then everybody would know that very quickly. But, you know, the government has now put in additional new programs. I mean, it's new program after new program where they're buying the secondary corporate bonds. I mean, you'll see them buy stocks. But if printing all of this new money was really what was a good thing, number one, why didn't they do it a lot sooner? I mean, they've been doing it since 2008, which is actually really when the system died. It, the coronavirus was did not kill the system. And no. we saw that leading into this. So, you know, people in 401ks, they have made it easier to take money out and they've even eliminated some of those penalties for people under 59 and a half to do so. They also might be able to do an in-service withdrawal rollover election which means they can trans, if they can't take it out of the 401k, they could roll it into an IRA and then take a distribution. Yes, you're going to pay your taxes and what have you. However, you know, that's still cheaper than 100%. But right. and my, pardon? I was just going to say, and then it would be self-directed if it's in an IRA. Well, it, it's, it's, it's they would have more choices. but it's still, they would have more choices, but you're still inside of the system. And you can do a physical gold and silver IRA. You can do that, but that is the most common kinds of gold and silver, which means that were they to do an overt confiscation of the gold, which history shows that is highly probable. I personally believe it's going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. I might be right or I'm going to be wrong. We'll find out. Um, so, but so for me, I took, I had a SEP IRA and I took the distribution because I want to control my money. And guess what? That old saying, possession is nine tenths of the law. In this case, it's 10 tenths of the law because it right. is completely invisible and out of the system. So yeah, it's a self-directed IRA. If they cannot do any of those things, then what they need to do is protect it outside of the system. And I, I'm sure, well, I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, but the strategy that I developed takes that into account. So what do you need to protect what you cannot get out of the system? What do you need to recoup the taxes, the fees, the penalties? What do you need to do to recoup that? Because when you say, well, what should people do? And it's not a surprise that the 401k system, which came into being in the 80s, right? It used to be the pension system, which made the companies and the corporations liable. But they started to transition that in the 70s with the IRAs and, you know, and get us all into the system that they were making money on. I mean, yep. you got to look at what the benefit is. They're going to sell the individuals, whether it's a currency change, like we were talking about with the euro, they're going to okay. sell the benefits to the naive public. And what you have is a time bomb. And when it goes to zero, I mean, who are you going to call? Seriously. Exactly. exactly. So, and, and it's also, I find really interesting how people still get suckered into believing that there is value in these markets. When, as you were saying, I mean, does anybody know what their income is gonna be when we can start to open up again? It's gonna look a whole lot different than it does. And yet you have, well, hey, the NASDAQ is what, 1% away from its all time high and the rest of the markets aren't really all that far off, yeah. but it is all Fed printing. It is yeah. all Fed printing. So if that were really a good thing, number one, why were we in a global slow down before COVID hit? Yes. Because they certainly did enough printing. And, and what they say is they just didn't do enough. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it's, it, 
they'll keep printing until they can't print anymore for sure because now there's nobody's saying this is a bad idea right literally no one is saying a lot of people are making a lot of money so um in the stock market but not well the it looks like it it looks yeah, like not the it common person necessarily but the, right. the people behind it i think Oh, the people behind it? Absolutely. And when you talk about mergers and acquisitions, well, you know, look at the banking sector consolidated tremendously from 2000 and through this crisis. But, you know, now they're not able to be of much help to the central banks anymore because they've pulled back in some risky areas. Definitely not all. Definitely not derivatives. They're they're gung ho on on these great big speculative bets, and that's even according to the CBO. But um, now it's the shadow industries that you were talking about in Europe. They're all they're global. They're absolutely global. These unregulated, and even if they're regulated, you know, there's winners and losers in everything. But is there? Because we're coming to a to a close. But is there anything that you want to tell people to kind of give them a heads up on maybe what you think they should be paying attention to? Yeah, I think I think in terms of the currency, uh, if we if they decide to switch us into something else, you're going to start to see some public relations around that. It, you'll you'll know it's coming because uh, there's a playbook already that's been established for the euro. And they may not use all of it. They may not print physical money. They might, there, there are things they might do, but there are things they have to do in terms of marketing this plan to have Absolutely. it be accepted. And you will know when it's coming. Now, devaluation of a currency is a completely different thing. The, you know, that happens overnight, you know, if they decide to. The big devaluation. Yeah, Inflation big is devaluation. devaluation but the that's, big one. that's happened also. So they know right. how to do that. But I think in terms of, of swapping us into something else, you will have a long lead of marketing. You'll just start to see, I mean, the Euro campaign was amazing. I mean, they had TV advertisement, they had posters, they had people with smiling faces and children with their Euros and they made the money pretty. And there was all sorts of, there was all sorts of very interesting. And they could also say, to be honest with you, I, I work a lot with security um, cyber and everything else. And they might just say they have to do it because of cyber. Exactly. They, they, could, they could literally one day just say we had an attack. I mean, people are being, you, you can't imagine how many people are being attacked like all the time, banks, companies, everything. Yeah. And you don't hear about it. And, um, no, they don't want you to know about it. Oh, of course. Utilities. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a big, that's a big one. Yeah, utilities have physical risk as well as, yeah. as as cyber risk. But um, you know, if you have if 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 they needed to, one day it could be like 9/11, but in within a cyber attack. And they could say, you know, we had to shut down the banking system because of a cyber attack and we're going to have to redo we're going to have to do something with the currency because it's at risk. And it could be something like that, but my guess is they'll try to do what they called an orderly reset. In uh, they're going to try, right? Yeah, right. absolutely. But so you know, these... there's a lot of excuses right now with COVID. So exactly. they they've got lots of they've got lots of runway to do all sorts of crazy things. So yeah, they do, and that's is that why you bought gold? Yeah, I bought I bought gold because. Um, I, for two reasons. One is um, in in the first in the recession that we had in the you know 2008 2009. I I did some things with gold, mostly in ETFs and stocks at that time, and it was a counterplay to what was going on with the economy. So, and I did and I did okay with that. But I don't like the counterparty risk of you know with with uh with stocks and and all sorts of things like that and mm -hmm. etf so i wanted fit something physical this time yeah so that's why that's that and i it it took me it took me a while to get used to the fact that i had to take possession of it in some respect you know yeah we've been taught possession is yeah. bad ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. You know, like but then but then once i got over that i was like oh well this this seems like and also there's, you know, I saw what happened to gold the last time it shot, it shot up and silver as well. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I bought it a 
I, I, I bought silver at like 17 and it went to like 50 or 45 mm -hmm. or something in a very mm -hmm. short time. But you know, that's why, that's why I, I had already dabbled in it. And I thought, mm, yeah, let's, let's, this, this looks like maybe there's no, there's no hedge. I mean, there's at this moment there, there's even the Swiss franc, which I could have, I, I have a European, I have two European bank accounts, one in euros, one in, one in pounds. And I could easily, you know, put money in my Euro account or put money in my pound account, but they kind of have the same problem that we exactly. have. Yeah. They're, so we're, we're, yeah. this is a global reset. This is, yeah. it has to be a global reset. And it's interesting that this is a global pandemic to push us into this global reset and the Swiss franc, you know, people have the perception that it's really safe, but it's really just a huge hedge fund. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's not so safe. They were the last currency to remove the gold backing in 78. And so that wa that's why they have this perception of being really safe. But uh, boy, Egon von Greyers just wrote a great article on on uh, the Swiss franc and Switzerland as a huge hedge hedge fund, and he's Swiss. So I think I, I think I read that one. Um, it was very wait. good. No, I read one by Tyler Durden. Oh, okay, that was very good. Also, yeah, yeah it's, it says uh, yeah, it basically says that the the Swiss franc is, is the Swiss banks are running it like a like a hedge fund. But here's the reality: all of the central banks are doing that now. Every single one, including the Federal Reserve, buying junk bonds? Really? Okay, then. So I really appreciate you being here. I mean, this has been great, Christina. Thank you so much. And it's so great to talk to just a normal person with a great perspective and experience in living through it. Because there is, I'm not saying this about you, I'm saying it about me. There is so, a benefit to, to being as old as I am, 65, is that I've lived through a lot of experiences. And that is something that youth cannot really replace. And, and living through history where you could go, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, I know how that happened. You know, it, th that's it worth so much. It's great. It's great experience. And the other thing that it teaches you is it may be uncomfortable for a while, but we will get through it. But mm -hmm. that doesn't that's not an excuse to not do your homework, not figure things out and not and, you know, not open your mail, not look at your bills, not not look at your bank account, not figure out what's happened to your money in the last three months. You know, it is this is the best time to learn if you I if you've agree. never picked up any information about currencies or economics or macroeconomics or how other countries work this is the best time because whatever you learn now will be why you are okay on the other side of this i could not have said that better myself very good very valid point very good point so thank you all for joining us today and if you have any questions about this or anything else Send them to questions at itmtrading.com. And remember, financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. Definitely not paper or ETFs. So until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.